in the churchyard of St Paul's there is a statue of Thomas Beckett. It's not like any other statue you'll see in St Paul's. They are all peaceful and tranquil and full of hope and serenity. Beckett's is different. Beckett is shown at the point of being murdered. His head is thrust back, he has his arm out as if to protect himself from his attackers. Thomas Beckett's story is one of the most shocking and violent in the history of the English church. Thomas Beckett was born around 1119 or 1120 in Cheapside. Cheapside is a street right by St Paul's Cathedral. Um, in the medieval period it was a big market street, a bit like Oxford Street is today. You could buy almost anything from Cheapside. Beckett works for the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's very successful and in 1155 the Archbishop recommends the King to appoint Beckett his Chancellor. The Chancellor at that time was like the King's main secretary. A really important job. The King is Henry II and he and Beckett quickly become the best of friends. William Fitzstephen said that never in the Christian era were two men more of one mind or better friends. One day they're riding through London together and they see an old man dressed in rags and Henry says to Beckett, it would be a very charitable thing to do to give this old man a cloak to keep him warm. And Beckett says, yeah, you're the king, you should probably see to that. They get into a wrestling match, Henry wrangles Beckett's fancy cape off him and gives it to the beggar. When the old archbishop dies, Henry puts his best mate Beckett in the top job and he thinks now I've got my friend in the top position I'll be able to tell the church to do whatever I like. However Beckett takes his job very seriously. He becomes devoted to God. He resigns his position of chancellor, he starts wearing a hair shirt, it becomes clear Beckett will not let Henry walk all over the church. In 1164 the king introduces the constitutions of Clarendon which grant him more power over the church. For example, they say that a cleric who commits a crime shouldn't be dealt with within the church but should be given over to the secular courts instead. Beckett refuses to sign the constitutions of Clarendon and he is convicted, therefore, of treason. Beckett flees to the continent and he starts excommunicating English bishops and nobles left, right and centre. Beckett remains in exile for six years. Both sides try to negotiate but ultimately nothing comes of it until 1170 when finally the Pope has had enough and he says look Henry if you do not let your bishop back into your country I will excommunicate you. Henry has no choice. He allows Beckett to come back and for a short while it looks like everything might be the way it used to be. But when Beckett returns, he excommunicates three more of Henry's bishops. When Henry hears the news, he flies into a rage and cries out, Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? Four knights, believing the king wanted Beckett out of the way, ride to Canterbury Cathedral where they find Thomas Beckett. They try to take him prisoner, but he resists, and so they murder him. One of them hits him so hard that he broke his sword. The top of Beckett's head is cut off. In pictures of Beckett you'll often see him missing the top of his head. This, this would be a horrible murder under any circumstances, but for the chief archbishop in the country to be murdered in his own cathedral is obscene. Beckett is made a saint just three years later. I guess it was quicker back then? His shrine quickly becomes the most popular shrine in the country. In fact in Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales it is Thomas Beckett's shrine that the pilgrims are visiting. The four knights are excommunicated by the Pope. Statues of them are built at Thomas Beckett's shrine not so they can be venerated but so that pilgrims can spit at them. As for the king, he is immediately remorseful. In 1174 he does penance, walking to Canterbury Cathedral barefoot and being whipped by monks. And he revokes the constitutions of Clarendon, which by now are political poison anyway. 350 years later, Henry VIII 
is on the throne. Henry VIII is not a fan of Thomas Becket. He hates the idea of an English saint who represents the church triumphing over the king. In 1538, Henry VIII has Becket's shrine pulled down. It takes 26 wagons to cart all the jewels and gold back to London. Becket is stripped of his sainthood and all the shrines and chapels to him are vandalised and eventually demolished. Henry actually hires a painter to deface all the images of Thomas Becket. Now, this guy's been dead for 350 years at this point, but Henry VIII still sees fit to charge him with treason. He puts him on trial, and of course he's found guilty. The Pope at the time seems to think that Henry VIII actually dug up Becket's bones, had them burned, and then fired the ashes out of a cannon. Now, it's probably apocryphal, but we don't know where his bones are. Since then, different people have seen Beckett in different lights. To T.S. Eliot, who was writing during Hitler's rise to power, Beckett was standing up against tyranny. Other historians have painted him as a troublemaker who's getting in the way of Henry II's much-needed reforms. In a BBC history poll a few years ago, he was actually named the second worst Briton of the last millennium. He only lost to Jack the Ripper. In the end, what you think about Beckett's story really says more about you than about any historical character. Do you sympathise with a king who killed one man in order to achieve a more just society? Or do your sympathies lie with an archbishop who won't let cronyism get in the way of doing his job? I always think the non-mythological saints are much more interesting than the ones who killed dragons or drove all the snakes out of Ireland because they can't possibly live up to being literally sainted. Beckett tends to be the one who gets the sympathy, because his temper tantrums didn't end up with someone being murdered, but most of Henry's reforms to the church are undeniably more just than the systems that were in place beforehand. Beckett's story asks us, at what point would we stand up to a friend? how we decide between a king and a god, and whether we would prioritise justice over peace.